In this part of section 1.2, we will talk about sampling methods. So first, let's talk about good sampling techniques, which involve some kind of a randomization process. First, we have a simple random sample. In this case, every group of individuals has the same chance. This should have the word chance here. Every group of individuals has the same chance of being selected as every other group of the same size. This is achieved by sampling at random and without replacement. So for example, at a company party, every employee's name is put into a hat and three names are randomly chosen to receive a gift card. Now notice that if your name gets selected, your name doesn't get put back in the hat. You can't win twice. Okay, so this is the without replacement is going to be important. So for something to be a simple random sample, everyone has the same chance of being selected. For example, put everyone's name in a hat and you pick three names at random so everybody has the same chance of being selected. Systematic sampling, it takes an organized but not random approach to the selection process. So we select some random starting point and then select every kth element after that starting point. For example, we can survey every 10th driver coming through a toll booth. In a movie theater, we can survey every 7th person in each row. Stratified sampling, this divides a population into at least two groups, and this is the important part for stratified sampling that share a same characteristic called the strata, and study participants at random from within each of those groups. For example, we can divide the class into students who have taken statistics in the past and students who have not taken statistics in the past. Now notice that the, both the groups, they have a common characteristic. The first group have taken statistics. The second group have not taken statistics. Then we can choose three random students from each group to survey. Another example, we can divide the population into males who are only children, females who are only children, males who have siblings, and females who have siblings. Okay, now let's, let's examine our four groups. In the first group, everyone is a male. That's a common characteristic. Not only are they male, but they also are only children. In the second group, every member is a female, and these are females who are only children. So that's a common characteristic. They share two common characteristics. One, they're females, and two, they're only children. In the third group, we have males, that's one common characteristic, who have siblings. And in the fourth group, we have females who are siblings. So each of these groups, every member of that group shares these common characteristics. Then we choose five people from each of the four subgroups to survey. On the other hand, cluster sampling, it divides a population into separate groups called clusters. Then we randomly select the cluster and choose all members from that selected cluster. Now notice the two differences. One is that a cluster doesn't have to have a shared characteristics. Okay, so we don't necessarily necessarily excuse my poor spelling, not necessarily a shared characteristic. Wow, that was really bad, I'm sorry. And two, we select all members of a selected cl cluster. Okay, all members of a selected cluster are chosen for the sample. Okay, on the other hand, in the previous example, we're only choosing five people from each of the subgroups. Here, we're only choosing three random students from each group. In a cluster sampling, the cluster doesn't necessarily have to have a shared characteristics. It's just a bunch of random people that are put in a cluster. But then we take all members of whatever cluster is selected. Okay, example, um, randomly select two tables at a cafeteria and then survey all people on those two tables to collect their thoughts on the cafeteria food. So again, these are people that are randomly seated. They don't have to have a, a common characteristic, but whatever table we pick, we're going to survey every single person from that table. 
Uh, another example, we randomly select three statistics classes at a college and survey all the students in those three classes. Now again, I, I do want to highlight the difference between a stratified versus a cluster sampling. In a stratified sampling, the group are called strata, uh, and we only sample only some elements from all strata. Okay, strata are homogeneous in the sense that they have an attribute that is all the same. And each strata alone does not represent the population well, which is why we sample some elements from all strata. A good example of this is let's say that you know our um, the Earth was about to end and we're all moving to some other planet, but we can only take a few people. So you want to have some engineers, you want to have some doctors, you want to have some artists, you want to have some architects. Um, so in this case, we would split everybody into whatever their occupation is and select just a couple of people from each occupation. That's stratified. On the other hand, a cluster sampling, the groups are called clusters, and we sample all elements from some clusters. So we only pick one or two clusters, or three or whatever, but we sample everybody from that cluster. Clusters are, are assumed to be heterogeneous, which means their attributes are mixed, and each cluster alone is a good representation of the population or so we hope. Here are some bad sampling techniques. A voluntary response. Individuals select themselves for the study. They're often different in an important way from the individuals who did not volunteer. Now, why are these voluntary samples biased and why are they bad? Because they often overrepresent extreme views. If you go to Yelp, a lot of Yelp uh, pages have all five stars or all one stars. There's no like middle ground. Somebody either gives them a five star or a one star. Okay, example, online poll, call and survey, magazine poll. Um, these are these people are calling in or they're going online specifically to uh, rate something or you know give their opinion on something. So off, more often than not, these people are doing this because they have some kind of extreme view one way or the other. So voluntary response. It's always a bad sampling technique. A convenient sample chosen because individuals were in the right place at the right time to suit the researcher. Um, this may be different from the general population in a subtle but important way. However, for certain variables of interest, a convenient sample may be fairly representative. And we'll talk more about this in class. Here's some examples. Ask your 20 closest friends to participate in a survey. Now, this may not be a good sample because your 20 closest friends, they might be your friends because they all share some kind of characteristic or a viewpoint. Um, for example, my closest friends uh, all happen to be very liberal. So if I were to ask them a political question, that's not going to be a good sample since most of my friends are very liberal. Um, another example is standing outside your classroom and asking people who pass by to participate in a survey. Um, again, this is not a good sample because, for one, you're only surveying college students who don't represent the general population. Secondly, the people who stop and actually participate in the survey might have a lot of time on their hands for whatever reason, um, or they just may be more uh, social, so that could bias your survey. So convenient sample also not a good sampling technique. Okay, um, I want you to, to go through the rest of the notes and uh, fill these in to the best of you know your ability, and we'll go over all of these in class.